Okay, so when I go in there for judgment, I need how many points to get into heaven? One thousand. Should be, no problem. I was a good husband, how many points do you think I'll get for that? Oh, two. Two? Well, how much for being a doctor now? I saved lives. Hmm, three points. That's it? What about the time I ran into that burning house to save a kitten? That was good. And? Two points. But I could have died. Two points. I banked a lot on that stupid cat. I'm sorry. So to get into heaven, I need... One thousand points. And I have... Seven. It's time for you to go in now. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm a pretty good fellow. If all I get is seven points, how does anyone get into heaven? They don't take the test. What? Now, why not? Because they know they don't meet God's standards. Then how do they get into heaven? They've asked Jesus to take the test for them. They get in on his score, not theirs. Are you putting your faith in what you can do or accomplish? Or are you putting your faith in God? A message from Lifeline Productions. 1-800-52-FUNNY at lifelinepro.com. Good morning. This is Radio Good News. The goal of this program is to draw all people to the love of Jesus Christ. I want everyone to know and experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are key to a Holy Spirit-filled and successful Christian life. I will focus on God's love because God's love is wonderful. You can write to me at Radio Good News, P.O. Box 1722, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57101. I'm John Thornton. I'll be reading from the Bible, the New Revised Standard Version, because that is God's word to us in our modern English language. Let's begin today with Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord, and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Those are God's words from Psalm 24. Our musical guest today is Enjoy.
That was Enjoy. We'll hear from them again at the end of the program. Stay tuned for that. Turn with me, if you can, to the book of 1 Timothy, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my loyal child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I urge you, as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia, to remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than the divine training that is known by faith. But the aim of such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Some people have deviated from these and turned to meaningless talk, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make assertions. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it legitimately. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy, because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I am giving you these instructions, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies made earlier about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have turned over to Satan, so that they may learn not to blaspheme. Those are God's words from 1 Timothy chapter 1. When I was in high school, I was part of a team, a small bore rifle shooting team. It was quite an interesting time to be in the basement of the high school shooting targets. As I contemplate those days, I've often thought about how different attending high school in the 1970s was as compared to what my high school daughters experience today. Oh, but I digress. I was part of the rifle shooting team. We would shoot at small targets with 22 caliber rifles. We had three positions we took to shoot. One was prone, that is lying flat on the floor on one's stomach. This was the easiest position as the rifle was well balanced with your elbows resting on the floor. I would score well shooting from the prone position. I consistently shot 95 out of 100. I never shot a perfect 100, but I did shoot a 97 once, nine bullseyes, and a seven. That was the closest to perfect I ever scored. The next position was kneeling, where you would kind of squat down and get your arms in position and hold the rifle steady. I never could get into that position now, since I have artificial hips and artificial knees, but back as a teenager, that position was easy. It was not quite as solid as prone, but kneeling was still pretty good. I would consistently score 85 out of 100 in the kneeling position. Shooting from the standing position was the most difficult. Your arms are not well supported, and aiming the rifle takes much more precision. I still did well enough to be on the rifle team, but my scores were usually 70 to 80 or so out of 100 in the standing position. Our rifle team never won too many matches, but we did get lots of practice at aiming and knowing the value of being on a team. 
<laughs> now you may wonder, why in the world is John talking about shooting? Has John finally lost what was left of his senses? Well, perhaps. But let's see if I can make a connection between competition shooting and being a successful Christian. For one aspect of shooting for competition is essential. That is aim. Aim is essential. And in life, aim is still essential. Today I want to start a series on the book of 1 Timothy. Today we will look at chapter 1. The key phrase in 1 Timothy chapter 1 is found in verse 5. The aim of such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. So how is your aim? The book of 1 Timothy is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul to one of the young pastors whom he had helped. That young man was Timothy, and he had answered God's call to go into the ministry, in part, through the teaching and preaching of the Apostle Paul. 1 Timothy was written by Paul in about the year 65 AD. Now, some Bible critics will cast dispersions on 1 Timothy and say all sorts of ridiculous things about it. But the author and recipient are clear from the first verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my loyal child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you happen to hear Bible critics knock out parts of the Bible, just knock them out for they're lost and doomed, but not literally. Timothy was a very interesting man. He was the son of a Christian lady named Eunice. Timothy's grandmother was a God-fearing Jewish woman named Lois. Lois was converted to Christianity late in her life. For when Jesus came, the Messiah was here. These righteous women raised up Timothy so that he knew the scriptures from an early age. We know that Timothy was a youthful reader of scripture. Paul calls Timothy his son in the faith. That is a great compliment. Timothy was ordained to be a pastor of the gospel. Timothy was uniquely gifted in evangelism and encouragement. Timothy was given difficult tasks. And this letter called 1 Timothy is a commission to one of those hard and difficult tasks. Timothy was instructed to remain in Ephesus so that he could insert, instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrines. Timothy was to oppose those who occupied themselves with myths and endless genealogies which promoted controversial speculations. And in the town of Ephesus there were many cults, false religions. So it was a hard task for Timothy to confront these people, but one to which God had equipped him. And the aim of such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. And that should be the aim of every Christian. Yes, every Christian should aim for love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. So how's your aim? Let's start with love. What is love? Have you ever seen the 1980s movie called Electric Dreams? That is a fun movie. In that movie, a young architect named Miles buys a new computer system. The computer system gets soaked in liquids and it somehow becomes sentient. It is alive, so to speak. Well, Miles has a beautiful neighbor named Madeline. And Madeline is a concert cellist. And during the movie, there are several fun duets played between the computer named Edgar and the Lady Madeline, the cellist upstairs. Well, anyway, in that movie, Miles and Madeline become romantically involved, and the computer asks, what is love? So let me ask you, what is love? Can you easily define love? Miles gives the computer Edgar a list of the consequences of love, like love is the most powerful thing, love can make you weak, love can make you sing, love can make you cry, to which Edgar, the computer, ends up saying, that does not compute. So what is love? In 2 John 1, 6, we read, And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard it from the beginning, you must walk in it. And John gives us a longer definition in 1 John 4, 17 through 21. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, 
but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. So does this answer what is love? Well, since Paul wrote this letter to Timothy and told us to aim for love, perhaps we should remember what Paul told us love was. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8, we read, If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. So do you have love in your life? How is your aim? Next, Paul says that we should aim to have love that comes from a pure heart. Here it is kind of like aiming from the prone position. It is solid and reliable. But what is a pure heart? Well, Paul gives Timothy a list of things which are not from a pure heart. Paul tells us that the law is good when it is used properly. And the Old Testament law is there to point us all to the fact that we are sinners in need of a Savior. That is the proper use of the law. This means understanding that the law is laid down for the guilty, the lawless, the disobedient, the godless, the sinful, the unholy, the profane, for those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Paul likes lists. So when people are involved in any of those sins, like sexual sinning, murder, supporting slavery, lying, or any other sin, then the law stands there telling us, you are wrong. The law works to point us to the fact that we need Jesus as our Savior and Lord. We need a Messiah. The law points to Jesus Christ. And loving Jesus is the only way to have a pure heart. Remember what Jesus said in the Beatitudes? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So get into the prone position and set your sights on having a pure heart. How is your aim? Next, Paul tells us to have love from a good conscience. This reminds me of shooting from the kneeling position. For only when I kneel in humble submission to God can I ever have a good conscience. For my conscience tells me that I have sinned in many and various ways. And the great apostle Paul speaks about his own conscience. Right here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 13, Paul writes, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Do you hear how Paul is humbling himself to his student Timothy? Paul admits that he has done shameful things in his life, things that are really bad. Paul knows they are sin. Paul never tries to come off as self-righteous or better than Timothy. If anything, Paul sets the example and shows us we should all confess our sins openly. For Paul knows the truth that Jesus loves us and waits for us to confess our sins so he can forgive us. So will you be strong enough to admit you are weak? Will you humble yourself and seek the God of all creation who will forgive you and make you clean again? You need grace. And remember, grace can be defined as God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. For Jesus loves you so much that he went to the cross to pay for your sins. He paid for all the sins of the Apostle Paul, and Paul had been a violent murderer. If God can forgive Paul, then God can forgive me, and God can forgive you. But you must seek God's forgiveness and shun those sins in your life. 
just take off that dirty old coat of sin and throw it away. Then Jesus will give you a bright new coat of white to cover you and keep you safe. So will you kneel down and set your sights on having love that leads to a good conscience? For only by receiving God's forgiveness will you ever have a good conscience. How is your aim? At the end of chapter 1, Paul gives Timothy a negative example about people who failed God's ways. Paul writes, I am giving you these instructions, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies made earlier about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have turned over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. Wow. Did you hear how strong that warning is? By rejecting conscience, people are turned over to Satan. That is a powerful warning. Satan seeks only to kill, steal, destroy, and deceive. Do you want to be handed over to Satan? Remember, Satan is a real entity that is far more evil and vile than you can imagine. Satan could rip you up one side and down the other before you even know you are under attack. But Satan is restrained by God. Do you really want God to release Satan to torment you? Will you listen? Will you listen to your conscience? Will you give up sin? Will you give it up? Or does God need to give you over to Satan so that you can learn? I pray that you will give it up. So kneel down and set your sights on having love that leads to a good conscience. And lastly, the key to all Christian life is to have love in a sincere faith. As Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This is kind of like shooting from the standing position. When you stand up in sincere faith, you may find life rather difficult. The trials and problems in life can knock you over more easily when you're standing up. Yes, it is harder to take aim at a righteous life when you are standing tall, but only by standing up can you walk forward and follow Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Remember, Jesus, Jesus used the illustration of building our houses on the rock. We can try to stand on rock or stand on sand. The sand will shift around and not give you any footing at all. Your aim will be gone. But the rock will always be stable and strong so your aim can be true. We all need to stand up for Jesus Christ. Will you stand up in faith, the faith that you have in Jesus our Lord? Are you willing to stand up for truth when everyone else is off wandering away chasing empty controversies? Will you stand up for morality and honesty when everyone else seems to be excusing their sins? Will you stand up and answer God's call like Timothy did, like Paul did? Will you be a real Christian and stand tall for Jesus? The important thing is to keep our aim focused and true through God's empowerment. And the truth is that Paul vividly lived that out in his life as did Timothy. Jesus has given us all mercy so that we may be aiming at a righteous life. And in this, Jesus Christ displays utmost patience. He works with us. Jesus equips us and empowers us to believe in him for eternal life. So how is your aim? Start by getting into the prone position. Set your sights on having a pure heart. Next, kneel in prayer and set your sights on having love that leads to a good conscience. And lastly, stand up for Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Do this and you will always be on the winning team. Indeed, to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm John Thornton. Thank you for listening to Radio Good News. I encourage you to seek out a church family where you can worship, be encouraged, and celebrate the love that God has for you. For this area offers many fine Bible-believing and teaching churches of various denominations. You can write to me at Radio Good News, P.O. Box 1722, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57101. May you richly know the blessings of the God who was, the God who is, and the God who is to come again. And we'll finish today with Enjoy. <laughs>